This video will introduce you to the exciting world of canoeing, one stroke at a time. Don't worry if you've never been in a canoe before, or if you're not sure of the difference between an oar and a paddle. In the course of this video, you'll meet a variety of people in a variety of canoeing situations, showing you the many faces of canoeing. We'll begin with a look at different kinds of canoes and accessories and what they're used for. We'll demonstrate how to get your canoe to and from the water and how to load and enter it. Next, we'll cover basic strokes and how to paddle safely on lakes. Moving water poses new challenges. We'll show you how to read the river so you understand what's happening with currents and rapids. Then we'll show you how to adapt lake paddling skills to canoeing on rivers. Finally, the section on river canoeing safety will ensure that you have trouble-free river trips. We suggest that you first watch the entire video to get an overview of what you'll be learning and then return and work forward chapter by chapter. Plenty of section headings make it easy for you to find your way around. In this first part, we'll get familiar with canoes and their accessories. The canoe's tapered ends allow it to move efficiently and silently through the water. It's maneuverable and light enough that it can be lifted easily and carried on land. Yet it can hold enough food and equipment to keep you going for weeks at a time. Most canoes have the same shape at either end, so it can be a little tricky to tell which end is the front or bow and which is the stern. You can usually identify the bow of the canoe by the positioning of the seats. There's plenty of room for your legs between this seat and the end of the canoe so you can comfortably sit facing forward. The stern seat is positioned so close to the end of the canoe that you don't have much choice but to sit facing the other way. The canoe's ends, or stems, are capped by deck plates, and the sides are topped by long pieces of wood or reinforced plastic called gunnels. The gunnels, in conjunction with the thwarts, which cross over near midships, help maintain the canoe's sleek shape. Though thwarts can be tempting to sit on, it's best not to use them as seats since they're not designed to support much weight. Running the length of the canoe at its center is an imaginary line called the keel line. This is the line of travel followed by the canoe when it's tracking straight ahead. It's also the balance point of the canoe and the place to keep your weight centered when you're seated or moving around. Next, we'll take a look at some of the materials today's canoes are made of. The most durable canoes are built of highly malleable plastic laminates like this. Canoes made of this stuff can literally be folded in half and they pop back into their original shapes. They also are relatively inexpensive. Fiberglass cloth impregnated with plastic resins is lighter than plastic laminate and it can be molded to precise shapes, but it's more fragile than laminate canoes. Many top-of-the-line canoes are now made of a space-age fiber called Kevlar. This synthetic cloth is impregnated with plastic resins just as fiberglass is, and it's tough. The same material is also used to make bulletproof vests. Kevlar is tougher than fiberglass, but still not as indestructible as plastic laminate. It produces light, expensive canoes with precisely molded features. A few illustrations will give you a sense of the different hull designs on the market and how they influence the performance of the canoe. When looked at from the side, like this, you can see that the bottom canoe has a straight keel line, while the canoe on top has pronounced rocker. That is, the keel line curves upward as it approaches the ends of the canoe. Canoes with straight keel lines easily hold a straight course, but they aren't very maneuverable. These canoes are popular for cruising long distances on flat water. Lots of rocker, on the other hand, gives great maneuverability while sacrificing straight-ahead speed and efficiency. Highly rockered canoes are made for paddling on rivers and in rapids. The design in the middle is a compromise between these two extremes and is adequate for all-around paddling. There are different paddle designs made specifically for different types of canoeing. And as you progress, you may want to learn more about them. But to get started, we recommend that you use a well-built, traditionally designed paddle like one of these, made either of wood or synthetic materials. 
The top end of the paddle is called the grip, and it's held like this in either hand. Your other hand holds the paddle shaft here, so that your hands are a little more than a shoulder width apart. The point where the shaft joins the blade is called the throat, and the business end of the blade is called the tip. Getting the right length paddle is important. What's right for you will be decided in part by how long your arms and torso are relative to the rest of your body and what kind of a canoe you'll be paddling. But a rough guideline is to choose a paddle that's a couple of inches short of reaching your chin. Paddles are also straight and bent shaft. Bent shaft paddles allow for a more efficient stroke and are used most often for cruising or racing. There are a few more things you'll need before pushing off from shore. Some kind of car top carrier will help you get your canoe to and from the water. Ropes secured to both deck plates are called painters. They are primarily used to retrieve a canoe in the event of a capsize. They're also useful for tying the canoe to the car and for securing the canoe to trees along the shore if you stop to explore on land. Life jackets are required in most states and should be worn. You want a snug but comfortable fit. Even if you have the good fortune of having a lake or river just outside your door, you'll need to know how to transport your canoe by car, if only to get it home from the store. Today's car top carriers do the job safely and easily, though you need to be sure that your ropes and knots are secure and tight. If you have rain gutters on your car, look for a roof rack with brackets that grip the gutter. Good racks are also available for cars without rain gutters. A less expensive option is to buy a set of foam blocks that fit onto the canoe's gunnels. The blocks rest on top of the car, and the canoe is tied down with a nylon strap that hooks onto the rain gutters. A great knot for securing the canoe to the roof racks is the trucker's hitch. You begin by taking a bite or loop of rope up here, then feed a second bite of rope from below into the loop and tighten it down. Next, run the free end of the rope through the exposed loop and pull it tight. The knot cinches easily and can be tied with a half hitch. By not passing the end of the rope through the half hitch, the whole thing can be undone with a pull of the rope. It's a neat trick. Two lines in front and back running to the ends of each bumper keep the canoe from blowing in high winds and provide extra security if the roof ties should fail. A taut line hitch is a good knot for these ropes. The running end loops several times around the other line and then crosses farther up for a final loop. If tightened properly, this sliding knot will hold securely. Unloading the canoe is where the teamwork starts. You and your partner can hold the canoe like this, one hand above and the other below the end. Make sure you're in agreement about which side of the car you'll flip the canoe down to, then move together. That's all there is to it. Remember to bend your knees to protect your back. The next task is getting the canoe to the water's edge. An easy way to do this is for you and your partner to each take an end and lift up either by holding onto the deck plate or gunnel or by reaching lower and lifting the stem. Getting the canoe into the water without getting your feet wet is easy too. To climb into the bow, one person will hold the canoe steady while the other keeps their weight low and centered on the keel line. It's best not to walk inside the canoe except when it's afloat. Did you notice that the hands are on the gunnels the whole time? That's important whenever you're moving about the canoe. Most canoes aren't tippy if you're careful to keep your weight low and centered. If you have passengers or packs with you, place them centered on the keel line and position so that the canoe is also balanced fore and aft. If you're launching at a rocky landing or riverbank, you need to get the canoe parallel to the shore, being sure to step into the canoe on the keel or center line. You won't get far in a canoe without some skill in using your paddle. In this section, we'll cover the strokes that you need to know in order to paddle in a straight line and to turn the canoe on flat water. Canoes are moved by applying pressure against the water with the paddle blade. The water is resistant enough that the blade actually moves very little when you take a stroke. It's almost as if you've stuck the blade in cement 
and use the shaft as a pole to propel you forward. There are two phases in any stroke that propels the canoe in a particular direction. The propulsion phase, where your body is at work applying pressure against the water, and the recovery phase, where the paddle is moved into position for the next stroke and you get a short rest. It may seem at first as if the forward stroke relies solely on arm strength, but that's not so. With proper technique, the strong muscles of the back and torso assist your arms with each stroke. Notice how the shoulders are rotated as you reach forward to plant the paddle to begin the stroke. It's like coiling a powerful spring. Then, as you execute the stroke, unwind your shoulders so that they rotate about 90 degrees. The result is that you paddle more efficiently without tiring as fast. We'll show you again. Keep both arms almost straight throughout the propulsion phase of the stroke. This requires you to rotate your shoulders and ensures that you're not just flailing away with your arms. Watch once again. Notice from this angle how you reach with your grip hand across your body so that the shaft of the paddle is nearly vertical throughout the stroke. See how the paddler rotates the shoulders and how he keeps the shaft vertical with the grip hand positioned out over the gunnels. Keeping the shaft vertical is important because the closer the stroke is to the keel line of the canoe, the less the canoe will veer off course. In slow motion, notice that during the recovery, the blade turns so that it slices through the air to reduce resistance. This is called feathering and comes in especially handy when paddling into a headwind. Also notice that the strokes are relatively short. Don't reach way forward and lift the paddle from the water just when it passes your hip. Longer strokes actually waste energy. The reverse stroke makes use of the same movements as the forward stroke, only, you guessed it, everything is backward. Even the opposite side of the blade applies the pressure against the water. The side of the blade pushing water in the forward stroke is called the power face. The other side is the non-power face. Notice how the shoulders still rotate and the arms are kept pretty straight. Now it makes sense that the forward stroke would make the canoe travel forward in a straight line, right? Unfortunately, it's not quite so simple because both paddlers are executing their strokes beside the canoe, about a foot away from the keel line, each forward stroke actually drives the canoe slightly off course. Also, the stern paddler's strokes tend to overpower the bows, so the canoe will tend to veer off course away from the side that the stern partner is paddling on, even if both partners are paddling on opposite sides of the canoe. Notice that both are paddling on opposite sides of the canoe. It's best to remain on opposite sides like this at all times to maintain stability. An easy way to keep the canoe on a straight track is for both paddlers to switch sides simultaneously just as the canoe veers off course. The timing of the switch is traditionally signaled by the stern saying, hut, or it can happen at regularly counted intervals. This method is called hit and switch paddling and is most often used by flatwater racers and long-distance cruisers. Watch closely how the paddle is switched from side to side. Another common way to keep the canoe on track is for the stern paddler to do a slight corrective stroke that compensates for the tendency of the stern to drive the canoe off course. The most efficient corrective stroke to use is called the J stroke. Begin the stroke just as you would a forward stroke making sure that your grip hand is well out past the gunnel. When the blade of the paddle reaches your hip, begin the corrective action. Watch the thumb of the grip hand closely. Turn your thumb down and away from your body. This rotates the paddle so that you can finish the stroke by prying the blade away from the side of the canoe. This prying action corrects for the turning effect of the forward stroke. Notice that the power face of the paddle continues to be pushing against the water throughout the stroke. You can see the canoe moves back on course each time the paddler in the stern completes another J-stroke. Notice how the grip hand is well out over the gunnel during the first phase of the stroke. Once you get moving, the corrective action of the J can actually be quite subtle, 
but it makes a real difference in having the canoe cruise straight ahead. If the stern paddler exaggerates the corrective part of the J-stroke, he can make the canoe do a gentle inside turn. Once underway, you may also need to turn the canoe away from the side that the stern partner is paddling on. The best way to do this is for the stern paddler to use a stern draw. This requires an exception to the common practice of keeping the paddle shaft vertical. You reach far out to the side of the canoe opposite your hip and sweep the blade in a shallow, wide arch toward the stern. Notice that you're using the power face of the paddle and that the shaft is closer to horizontal than vertical. Also notice how you rotate your shoulders so that your chest faces the paddle's shaft through the stroke. It may take a couple of these to complete a turn. Like the J-stroke, the beauty of the sweep is that you lose little forward momentum when you use it. There are times when you need to move the canoe sideways. There are two strokes useful for this sort of maneuvering. They're called the draw and pry. We'll cover the draw first. The draw stroke draws the canoe sideways through the water toward the side of the canoe on which the stroke is applied. To set up for the draw stroke, plant your paddle away from the canoe, directly out from your hip. Notice that as you reach to the side, you're rotating the shoulders so that the chest is almost facing the paddle shaft. It's also important to get your grip hand far out over the gunwale so that the shaft is vertical throughout the stroke. The stroke itself is simply a matter of drawing the canoe toward the paddle. Notice that the power face of the blade is applying pressure against the water. Once the blade is next to the gunwale, it can be repositioned for another draw stroke with an underwater recovery. To do this, rotate the paddle 90 degrees by turning the thumb of your grip hand away from your face. Then you can slice the blade through the water until it's in position for the next draw. When both partners draw at the same time on opposite sides, the canoe pivots in place. It's the stern paddler's job to time his strokes to coincide with his partner's. Now let's say you suddenly need to move the canoe sideways in the opposite direction. The pry is the ticket. As its name suggests, in the pry stroke, you actually pry the paddle blade away from the side of the canoe using the gunwale as a fulcrum. Remember the power face and the non-power face of the blade? For the pry, you use the non-power face to exert pressure against the water. Start with the vertical shaft against the side of the canoe. Then simply use the gunwale as a fulcrum to pry the blade away from the hull. Notice how you can grasp the gunwale with your thumb to hold the paddle firmly in place? This works well except when you're in moving water or your blade could catch on an underwater rock and cause your thumb some pain. You reposition the blade for the next stroke using an underwater recovery by rotating the blade 90 degrees so that it can slice through the water. To control the blade angle, turn the thumb on your grip hand so that it's pointing away from you during the recovery. If both partners use the pry simultaneously, it will cause the canoe to pivot. And if one paddler pries while the other draws, the canoe will slip sideways through the water. You should practice all of these strokes under calm conditions until you feel relaxed in the canoe and the canoe is going where you want it to. Running a canoe through a challenging set of rapids can be one of life's greatest thrills. Riding all that fluid energy and using it to direct your canoe where you want to go is really exciting. But to do it successfully takes skill and understanding of the river. In this chapter, we'll introduce you to the dynamics of moving water. We'll also cover the common hazards you'll need to avoid for a safe, fun river trip. Rivers can change character dramatically from season to season, day to day, and sometimes even within hours, just by the amount of water they carry. What looks like a gentle enough stretch can now quickly become a raging torrent completely unsuitable for canoes. So it's important that you know what you're getting into before you push off from shore. Generally, the time of highest water is in the spring, when snow melts or when rains are often heavy. But sometimes, locally heavy rains can cause unexpected rises in water levels at other times of year. 
Rivers rise at different rates according to their size and the size of their watersheds, the type of soil found there, and even the sort of vegetation growing. In times of low water, you can often see the effects of a high water runoff by the debris that is collected in trees and shrubs high up on shore. Even the gentlest river is not a good place to be canoeing during floods, as a river overflowing its banks creates many dangerous and unexpected hazards. As rivers make their way toward the sea, they always seek the least restricted and steepest route. You can't assume that a placid stretch at the roadside landing means that the river will remain that way around the bend. Again, guidebooks and experienced canoeists can assist you in finding appropriate rivers to run. The international scale of river difficulty is used by river runners to classify rapids and sections of rivers according to the challenges they present. The scale runs from class 1 to class 6. Class 1 rapids have few or no obstructions and may have ripples or small waves. They're well suited for novices or for those seeking a relaxed outing. Class 2 rapids have wide clear channels that are obvious without having to scout from shore. Occasional maneuvering may be necessary and waves may be a couple of feet high but are usually avoidable. These rapids require basic river maneuvering skills. Rapids rating a class 3 are for skilled canoeists. Irregular waves large enough to swamp a canoe may be difficult to avoid and large waves and other hazards may be present but are easily avoided. Usually class 3 rapids should be scouted from shore before being run. Class 4 rapids are for expert canoeists. They are intense, powerful, and require precise maneuvering in turbulent water, and they may have dangerous hazards that are difficult to avoid. Rapids rated class 5 or 6 are generally beyond the level of even expert open canoeists. They have extremely dangerous features and are at the outer limit of navigability. One of the things that makes rivers so fascinating is the dynamics of moving water. Even where the river seems to be flowing along gently enough, there's more happening than first meets the eye. The flowing water meets resistance along the banks and river bottom, so it's usually flowing fastest where it is deepest. On a straight section of river, that's usually in midstream. But when a river rounds a bend, the water tends to pile up on the outside, creating a deeper channel with faster moving current. Often river bends will have shallows or sandbars on the inside of the bend which make for slow paddling. So on river bends, the longest route is often the fastest, though you may need to take care that the current doesn't carry you against the shore. One other thing to know about river bends is that the erosion that takes place against the river bank by the water piling up on the outside of the bend can undermine the roots of trees and cause them to fall into the river. A downed tree like this is a serious obstacle that should be avoided at all costs. The danger is that the water is able to flow through the branches, but solid objects, like canoes and people, can become trapped and held beneath the surface. Also, you're almost guaranteed to capsize if you tangle with a downed tree in moving current. So you'll want to keep your eyes open and make sure that the stronger current on the outside of a bend doesn't take you where you don't want to go. One last word about river currents. The force of moving water is deceptively powerful. Even a relatively mild looking current rushing against a rock like this is easily capable of folding a canoe in half. For that reason, it's important that you always remain alert on the river and keep your canoe under control. Besides fallen trees, which are sometimes referred to by canoeists as strainers, there are other more friendly obstacles that make up a typical rapids. We'll take a look at these one at a time. Boulders that occupy the stream bed create a set of hydraulic features that are useful to canoeists. You can see that the water immediately downstream of this boulder is relatively quiet. This slack water is called an eddy and is a great stopping place for canoes. When the downstream current encounters the boulder, it flows around it and then fills in the space just downstream of the rock and this becomes the eddy. As it enters the eddy, 
the current actually reverses direction and flows upstream. This water flowing upstream is separated from the downstream current by eddy lines. These are quite distinct at the upstream end of the eddy where the differential between the two currents is strongest. Moving downstream, the eddy lines gradually lose their distinction, tapering off into the eddy's tail. If two boulders are near each other in the river, there is often a V that is shaped by the water deflecting from the face of the two rocks. As long as these V's are pointing downstream, they generally indicate a safe passage. Now if the boulder is just under the surface of the water so that the current rushes smoothly over it in what is called a pillow, a V is formed that points upstream toward the rock. An upstream V like this is something to be avoided. A similar boulder in the midst of a deeper, more powerful downstream current creates a different hydraulic feature called a hole. In a hole, the water pours sharply over the top of the rock to create a depression just downstream that is filled with water rushing in from all directions. The water recirculates here, and if it's powerful enough, can hold passing objects like canoes in its grip. Advanced canoeists find some holes fun to play in, but when starting out, you had best avoid them. Dams and rapids like this are sometimes difficult to detect from upstream. There may be little sound of rushing water to clue you in that the dam is there. Sometimes the only indication is what's called a horizon line, which is an often subtle line that shows a break in the surface of the water. If you see one of these, get to shore and carry your canoe around the dam. When researching a stretch of river, check for the presence of any low head dams. Among the most readily recognized whitewater features are the lines of waves called haystacks often found at the runout of a rapid. Contrary to common sense, usually these dancing waves indicate a safe and exhilarating passage for a canoe. Haystacks are formed by water that is moving fast down a steep gradient meeting slower moving water accumulated in a pool. The fast water piles up on itself in a regular wave pattern as it loses its momentum. If the waves are large, you may want to route your canoe just to the side of the peak so you don't swamp. Occasionally a wave or two will appear in isolation instead of in a chain of haystacks. If the current moves on through the wave without any visible loss of momentum, you should have clear sailing. Taking the time to study the features of a rapid from shore is important until you learn to recognize them easily. Scouting from shore is also important if you're unsure of how to negotiate a rapid or if it goes out of sight around a bend. On easier rapids, you can pick your route as you go. Both bow and stern should participate in this process and tell each other what they're seeing. The stern generally decides on the actual route. If the best route through a rapid is a little less obvious, you may need to stop and scout from eddies. But if you still have any question about where to go and whether you can get there, you'd be wise to get out and take a close look from shore. In picking a route through a rapid, you want to start at the bottom and work your way upstream to the top. If you do it the other way around, you may wind up someplace you don't want to be. In talking about what you see on the river, you want to be sure that whomever you're talking with shares the same orientation as you. To avoid the confusion that results from not being sure if you're looking at a rapid from upstream or downstream, paddlers commonly refer to river left and river right as the left and right side of the river when looking downstream. What you're about to discover is that you already know how to do what we just did. That's because the skills that you've mastered for flat water paddling are the same as what's called for in rapids. You only need to learn how to apply them in an environment where everything's in motion. So to start out, we'll get you oriented to paddling in currents. When you're paddling in rapids, it's up to you whether you want to run faster than the current, at the same speed as the current, or slower than the current. First, we'll take a look at paddling the same speed as the current. One advantage of doing this is that it requires the least work from you, since you're actually drifting much of the time. Also, because you're moving fairly slowly, you have time to react to obstacles that show up in your path. 
follow us as we work our way through this next set of easy rapids. You'll notice that we'll be using a lot of draws and pries to maneuver where we want to go. It's important to be talking to your partner about what obstacles are in your path and where you intend to go. You also need to be looking way downstream to plot your route so you don't get yourself into trouble. There are times when paddling faster than the current is the best way to get where you need to go. To do this, you must anticipate your route far in advance, then point your canoe where you want it to go and power ahead. Notice that the strokes used are the same as when paddling forward on flat water, except that an occasional draw or pry may be added to assist in maneuvering. Paddling slower than the current gives you lots of time to look and plan ahead. It's a conservative way to go, and is particularly useful if you need extra time to plan your route as you progress downstream. When actually running a river, you'll probably be constantly alternating between going faster, slower, and the same speed as the current, depending on the circumstances. The technique used to maneuver the canoe back and forth when paddling slower than the current takes some practice to master. It's called a downstream ferry, and we'll take a closer look at it now. This maneuver is called a ferry because it moves the canoe across the river without being swept downstream, just like the old-time river ferries that transported horses and wagons across the river on a fixed cable. The maneuver is called a downstream ferry because both paddlers are facing downstream. It works like this. The canoe is angled slightly so that the current pushes on one side. Now, by paddling backwards or upstream, the paddlers resist the current's tendency to sweep the canoe downstream, and the current pushing against the side of the canoe instead moves it across the river without the canoe losing ground. The key to the downstream ferry is setting the canoe's angle properly and then maintaining it through a combination of backstrokes, draws, and pries. You can use the downstream ferry to slip neatly into an eddy if you want to get out of the moving current. The upstream ferry is another way to get the canoe across the river without being swept downstream. It's better than the downstream ferry if you're in an eddy and want to cross over to the other shore. First, you need to back up so you have enough space to get up some speed before leaving the eddy. Then paddle forward to cross the eddy line close to the upstream end of the eddy at about a 10 degree angle. The moment that the bow of the canoe enters the downstream current is a critical one. The current wants to grab the bow and sweep it around so that the canoe is spun sideways. To counter that tendency and maintain the proper angle, the stern needs to execute a powerful draw stroke. One strong draw in the stern is all that's needed to maintain the canoe's angle as it enters fully into the downstream current. Notice that the bow partner keeps making forward strokes during the entire maneuver. Now that the canoe is fully in the current, the stern can control the proper angle using J and sweep strokes. This time the stern paddler has to do a strong pry just as the bow enters into the downstream current. When you're in the stern, it's good to be able to ferry using either a draw or pry, but you may find that the draw is a bit more powerful, and so you might want to rely on it if you're ferrying in powerful currents. The peel-out is an exciting move that quickly gets you into the downstream current in style. We'll watch these two show us how it's done. As with the upstream ferry, you'll need to back up a bit to create some room to power out of the eddy. Also like the upstream ferry, the angle at which the canoe crosses the eddy line in a peel-out is critical. In this case, since you want the canoe to be swung around by the current, the ideal angle is about 45 degrees. As the bow paddler crosses the eddy line, she reaches out to plant the paddle in the draw position. The power face of the blade is angled so that it will catch the downstream current full force. The bow paddler leans out past the gunwale so that the canoe is leaned into the turn. This lean is really important, because without it, the current rushing against the upstream side of the canoe will flip it over before you know what's happened. As is almost always the case, lean downstream, never lean upstream. During this part of the maneuver, the stern executes a series of short sweeps. 
The eddy turn involves the same strokes as the peel-out, except that the timing is crucial and a bit more complicated. Because you're moving with the downstream current and the eddies are staying still behind the rocks or along the shore, turning into an eddy is a little like hitting a moving target. This canoe is approaching the eddy properly. It's moving faster than the current and positioned so it will pass as close to the rock as possible. Once the eddy line is beneath you, the bow paddler plants the paddle in the eddy, leans into the turn, and the boat snaps around. The stern partner helps out with a pry. In order to get into position for the eddy turn, both paddlers have to power across the downstream current. To do this well requires a sense of timing that you can only get with practice. You want to enter the eddy as near as possible to its upstream end because the eddy line is strongly defined there and the turn is easier. But you also don't want to have so much speed that you blast through the eddy and run up on shore. Once you get comfortable performing all those maneuvers in moving water and in easy rapids, you'll be ready to venture downstream on your own. If you've taken time to practice the material we've presented, and if you're careful not to take on challenges beyond your ability, canoeing will be safe, fun, and satisfying. If you're interested in more information about outdoor activities, look for Backpacking Made Easy, How to Enjoy Camping from Your Very First Trip, and Finding Your Way in the Wild.